have you ever had your heart deeply broken? I think our answers would vary around the room, but I imagine most of the time it is something done against us from the hands of another. And these are real, and these are deep wounds of deep sorrow and unceasing anguish, which will be tears that we must carry through this life and into Christ's kingdom where we know and enjoy the promise that he will personally wipe away those tears for the last time. But these are not to be the Christian's only tears. Paul had pains in the depths of his heart, which he outlines in great detail in this letter to the Romans. So, have this in mind as we approach Romans 9, verses 1 through 5 together. I will read this for us. This is the holy word of our God. I am speaking the truth in Christ. I am not lying. My conscience bears me witness in the Holy Spirit that I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart. For I could wish that I myself were accursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my brothers, my kinsmen, according to the flesh. They are Israelites, and to them belong the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the worship, and the promises. To them belong the patriarchs, and from their race, according to the flesh, is the Christ, who is God over all, blessed forever. Amen. Let's go to the Father together. Oh, Heavenly Father, we have come by the calling of your voice to gather to worship you. Your church has sung the glad songs of our Lord's salvation as we remember the great works of our God, saving us, sustaining us, providing for us. We come here with all our rejoicings. We come here with all of our pains that we might be ministered to by your rich mercies. Lord, I pray that you would answer my prayers this week, as you know you have heard in preparation for this sermon. That, Lord, we, your people, would hear your voice, that our minds would be renewed, that our hearts would be stirred with a great passion to see you glorified in this world. And Lord, we ask that you would instruct us we are but a gathering of fools. We are stubborn in our flesh. We have sinned. And yet you are a forgiving God of great grace. Lord, remove distractions that we may hear your voice. And that we would rejoice in the great God of our salvation in Christ. Bless us, O Lord, by the rich and much needed mercies for this hour. We ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Paul ended, if you remember, chapter 8, with the joyful promise of those who, with trust in Jesus Christ, are made right in God's eyes, justified in God's eyes forever, because God's electing love and sovereign grace saves sinners through Jesus, and such Christians will never, never be separated from God's love. No trial on earth. Not even death can separate us. We are guaranteed, no longer condemned by God's grace alone, through faith alone, in Jesus Christ alone. Now, Paul could have continued his well-thought-out argument straight to chapter 12. That's what is seemingly odd in Romans. It goes from the end of chapter 8, and if you take that and read Romans 12, verse 1, it fits so perfectly, it seems like that's where it should have gone. Because he goes with a therefore, and he's referring to everything is set up to this point, but it, it looks like it just com completely connects Romans 8 straight to 12. But a great anguish is gripped the heart of the apostle Paul. And he says, I must speak to this truth. I must spend a couple of chapters on this. And it explains why Paul goes from joy-filled celebration of God's love straight into deep lamentation. A category that every Christian should have. We are not just a rejoicing people. We're a lamenting people. And Paul 
says, what is the deep grip of pain upon my heart that I must spend some time on? He says, I I want Jews to celebrate God's grace. I want them to celebrate God's great love for us in Jesus Christ too. In Acts 18, Luke informs us that the emperor Claudius ends up kicking out all the Jews out of Rome. And as Jews spread throughout the rest of the region, Paul sets himself out to go from synagogue to synagogue, trying to persuade these Jews that Jesus is the Messiah. But Paul faced fierce opposition instead. So Paul shook his garments, and he exclaimed, Your blood be on your own heads. I am innocent. From now on I go to the Gentiles. Paul, the apostle to the Gentiles, not by the will of man, but by the will of God, has spoken clearly. Abraham's children are children of faith in Jesus Christ alone. And he has argued that very brilliantly up through this point, even in Romans. So why stop here? Why not go to Romans 12, verse 1? Why stop here for a moment? Well, The original Roman church may have been almost overwhelmingly all Jewish, but now, these many years after Acts 18, Gentiles have taken up the majority of the Roman church. So, if you would turn with me to Acts 13, verses 44 through 48. In Acts 13, verse 44, it reads, The next Sabbath, almost the whole city gathered to hear the word of the Lord. But when the Jews saw the crowds, they were filled with jealousy and began to contradict what was spoken by Paul, reviling him. And Paul and Barnabas spoke out boldly, saying, It was necessary that the word of God be spoken to you, as Jews, first. Since you thrust it aside and judge yourselves unworthy of eternal life, behold, we are turning to the Gentiles, for so the Lord has commanded us, saying, I have made you a light for the Gentiles that you may bring salvation to the ends of the earth. Paul told these Jews who reviled him that the Jewish people were given the word of God first, only to thrust it aside, proving to be unworthy of eternal life. So is that it then? Is that it? it That's it? No. No. Paul explains the depths of his heart for Israel's salvation. That's why he goes out of his way here in Romans 9 and 10 and 11. That's why we're not going straight to Romans 12 verse 1. Paul is Jewish, and he longs for his kinsmen in the flesh to come to know Jesus as Messiah. And how Paul longs for his own people, the recipients of God's promises, now alienated from Christ, hostile with the God to see Jesus, Messiah, just as Paul has found him, where the Messiah confronted him, the great persecutor of the church. So have this in mind. We looked at, again in verse 1. Paul says, I am speaking the truth in Christ. So he's invoked that he is in Christ speaking this. I am not lying. My conscience bears with me witness in the Holy Spirit. In Christ, in the Holy Spirit, I'm speaking to you authoritatively in God. And Paul emphatically appeals to his truth telling. In the positive, he shouts, I am telling you the truth. Then on the flip side, I'm not lying. All to underscore what he is telling this church in Rome. He says, my conscience bears me witness in the Holy Spirit, like a man swearing an oath in court, that the truth he speaks, he has a witness to be called. None other than the Holy Spirit himself. Why all this then? Why couldn't you, he just said, I'm telling you the truth and just move on? Paul's grace-filled, law-free gospel mission to the Gentiles had seen so many Gentiles enter the church and so, so few Jews. What I hear Paul saying is an encouragement to his Jewish kinsmen, but also to the Gentiles who may, and to discourage any of them from looking down at Jews. When you speak and say, I'm telling the truth, beloved, 
Is this something you would think the Holy Spirit would bear witness? When you say, I'm going to tell someone the truth, I'm going to be an honest person. Usually we kind of put honesty in a category of, well, um, honesty like, you know, he was talking about used car sales lots. It was like honest owls or something like that. And you're like, well, that's, well, he's honest. Well, he's kind of playing it as more of a self-promoting thing. And Paul is being honest in a point, in, to a point where he's saying, I'm telling you in Christ and in the Holy Spirit, is this what we say? We say, I'm going to be an honest person. I'm going to tell so-and-so the truth in love. And I'm going to say that in Christ. Would the Holy Spirit say, Amen? Yes, you are telling the truth. Because there is that conscience that Paul is speaking of. It's in my conscience. I have a witness in the Holy Spirit that what I'm telling you, beloved church in Rome, is the truth. And what truth do you want to proclaim? Here is Paul's truth telling in verse 2. That I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart. Great sorrow, and this is, there's an anguish in his heart that just will not go away. And he knows on earth it will not go away. So here is the truth telling Paul, opening his heart to us. He is in deep grief of the soul. As he's writing, he, while well, he's speaking it out loud, and his church is just trying to scribble it down, he's probably like wondering, well, th- where is this going? Right at the end of eight. Great joy-filled celebration. And then all of a sudden, Paul breaks out in lament. I create pains in me. He's not lying about his grief, but being very vulnerable to the church to show the wondrous truth about God's grace in Jesus Christ. Let me ask you, do you ever lament? I mean, lament before God. Not just get hurt and cry over your hurt and go to your friends about your hurt. Do you, do you ever lament before God? Do you lament before God with an unceasing anguish that you know will not go away on earth? You have to carry this sorrow and these tears right up to the Lord Jesus Christ when he returns for us. Do you tell the truth like Paul in the Holy Spirit in Christ? And your truth-telling has caused such deep pain, not for being wronged, but because folks close to you, friends, family, children, neighbors, do not have a joy-filled, saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. That's the pain that Paul is in. He's been wronged. You can read it up in Acts. He's been hurt. He's been abandoned. He's been in prison. He's been beaten. He's been mocked. And in all these things, he could say, I have deep anguish in my heart. I have so many enemies. They hurt me. They wound me. No. What is the great lament of Paul? My kinsmen do not know Jesus Christ. They do not know him as Messiah. The humble worship of Jesus Christ leads the Christian to have the pains for the souls of others. Do you have a deep grief over your family, friends, neighbors? who are not in church right now worshiping Christ alongside of you? Do you realize that that pain is something we bring to the Lord? Jesus is not being worshipped by many people that I know and deeply care for. And Jesus is worthy of their worship. It bothers me. But Paul's language goes far beyond a man who is simply bothered by people who are not worshiping Jesus. And he isn't lying about it. He isn't waxing poetic. He isn't just being exaggerative to teach Rome. Well, I just want you to know, church, that this is a passion that you should have. This is a passion he has. His heart is grieved without ceasing and in deep sorrow that Jesus isn't being worshipped by others. And that is my, my plea this week. It's been, Lord, be gracious And hear our prayer. Break our heart for the lost. Put this grief into our hearts that it's unceasing. That our dinner tables would see sinners eat with us. That we might share the good news of Jesus Christ with them. That we don't just hold neighbors that are at a distance from us. Oh, they're worldly. I don't want to have anything to do with them. Or I just, oh, I might actually slip up and sin in their presence. You know, so I better not 
do that because I'll be joining in or whatever. Instead of seeing them as, God, my heart is broken that they do not know you. And here I am holding on to the gospel without ever giving it to them. Break my heart. Put the sorrow into my heart that I might serve and care for those hurting in the world that Christ's gospel would mend the brokenhearted. And we Christians have such joy in Christ that we lament with deep pains in the heart for their loved ones who do not know Jesus. And he sees, verse 5, that Christ is blessed forever. And he says, Amen to that. He takes his grieved heart for the lost to Christ. He says, you know, I don't perfectly evangelize wherever I go. I confess this even before the Lord now in this hearing. I don't always do the work of an evangelist. I long to. My flesh get the best of me at times. But I know where to take my grieved heart for the lost because I can't save them. I know where to take it, where there is grace that is sovereign. I know where to take the prayer for those who I deeply love and care for that are not here this morning. And say, Lord, save them. Whatever it takes, save them. Put them on a hard path that I might be a layer alongside of them to tell them of the great rich mercies of God. So that is my plea for you beloved. Christ is merciful. He hears the prayers of his church, so pray for the lost and pray that you will humbly serve and proclaim only the only gospel that saves the lost. Let's continue on. Verse 3. So he says, I have great anguish, unceasing anguish in my heart, for I could wish that I myself were accursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my brothers, my kinsmen, according to the flesh. Paul is painting a picture for us. And again, he's not being exaggerative. You know, the type of sermons, that they, they exaggerate everything, is so blown out of proportion to teach you. Paul's not doing that. Paul is saying that this is really my heart. What is driving him to go on ships and sail around? What is driving him to walk from town to town knowing that when he gets to a such and such village, he's just going to receive more insults and more pains upon pain? What's driving Paul? He paints this picture for us. And it's very personal. And and, and it's something that I reflected on quite deeply myself. I I confess that sometimes I get... I find myself lost in the day-to-day. Don't tell me you don't do it. Let's, re- let's reflect on this together, shall we? You get to the day-to-day grind, and you're thinking, well, what am I going to do the rest of this day? What am I going to do tomorrow? And you're so used to just planning and just carrying it through that you forget the grand purpose of why you're even breathing. And I think of this of myself, what the Lord often reminds me, how I found myself in Hamilton, Ohio. (laughs) Because I wasn't exactly pursuing this. And so I I, I want to bring you down a road of a little bit of when I preached my first trial sermon here. It was over seven years ago. It, It was one of those things where I was trying to make the wisest decision for my family, trying to think through future and all of that. And all of a sudden, I got smacked in the face by the call of God when I came up here and preached. It wasn't until I reached um, the pulpit up on the stage that I realized this is where I'm supposed to be. And in quiet, weird, eerie quietness, the four of us was before the girls in the car on the way back to Kentucky. It was quiet until we finally reached the river. We had to stop off at a gas station as you parents know, with little ones, that's, that's pretty much the increment of all travels. You know, you get down the road, if, small bit by bit, because you've got to go to a gas station. And then my wife and I simply looked at each other and said, this is where we're supposed to be, isn't it? And Jesus reminds me of that moment over and over. 
I did not call you up here to live a comfortable life. I called you up here to suffer for my name, that you would call the unbelievers unto me to be saved, to be a preacher of God's word, to be a shepherd of God's people. And like Paul, I can look back at the deep pains of ministry. I can think through face after face and name after name that has wounded me. And that's, that's not healthy because Paul doesn't do that. He could have. He could have spent two and a half chapters on, well, so-and-so hurt me, and he does that in other letters. He says, you want to avoid them because they're enemies of the cross. But he doesn't do that here. The hurts from other people I know cause unceasing anguish, but not to the level that Paul is speaking of. The challenge of seeing my flock wounded also is something that I have learned that I have to carry as a pastor. But there is a deeper groaning in my heart that I hear Paul fleshing out. Let me ask you, what will happen in your life if you cross that line which your flesh warns you not to cross? I don't mean the Holy Spirit. I mean your flesh. And you say, well, what line, Pastor? The line from safety and into following Christ as a living sacrifice to God, as Paul is about to flesh out in Romans 12. What will happen if God amends your prayer to break your heart with such an unceasing anguish that it drives you to go and evangelize to everyone you come into contact with? That's what Paul is fleshing out. He's not saying, hey, I travel comfortably, I go to synagogues comfortably, and I just stay within my little Christian circles where I'm comfortable and happy. He says, what is driving me to the Gentiles, and he's saying that in the midst of longing for his Jewish brethren to come to Christ, what is driving me is that I have unceasing anguish for the lost. So what would happen? As you pray right now, God, break my heart. Whatever it is, I want to be a living sacrifice to you to make disciples of everybody. For your glory's sake, I ask you. What if he says, amen? How much of your life would change if each night you brought tears in prayer because your heart is so grieved for people who are not believers? You know, I'll I pause here to say, not only did I confess my day-to-day coasting, I need to repent of it. I need to repent of this day-to-day coasting through life, and I have a feeling I'm not the only one in the room. Southwest Ohio doesn't need another church invite or program. They need Jesus and the church to be equipped as a grieving army, only comforted in Christ to proclaim the gospel that we are not ashamed of, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Because that's where Paul is fleshing out of. There's a reason why I am not ashamed of the gospel that I've preached to not only you Jews, but also you Gentiles. And before you Gentiles start getting a haughty head about things that, oh, there's more Gentiles coming in and not this previous generation of Jews, let me tell you about them. I grieve. I don't mock that Jews aren't coming to Christ. I grieve with deep pains that I can't get rid of. And Paul says, I grieve deeply with deep sorrow for my kinsmen to know Christ. I would die and be cursed and cut off from Christ forever for them. I would like to be cut off from Christ that all of them will be welcomed in. And Paul cannot be the substitute for Israel's salvation. Do you recall the ram stuck in the thicket? Not Isaac. But Abraham's, Abraham's only son, bound on the altar. No, bound and placed on the altar was the ram of God's own providing. Who can be the substitute sacrifice for those I care about to save their souls? Do I go to them and say, I, I would rather be cut off from Christ that you would know Jesus? What a heart 
in the Apostle Paul. And before you say, well, that seems exaggerative, he is not lying. He's telling us that in Christ. His conscience bears witness in the Holy Spirit that what he is saying is true. His heart is deeply crushed. And so if, if this is the heart of a Christian who wants to see non-Christians become Christians, and he says, you know what, I can't be that level of substitute. He's saying, look to the one who is. Christ came to be a curse for others. You want to use the cut off language? It was cut off that those who would join in would never be separated from the love of God in Christ Jesus. That is how he ended Romans 8, and that's the connection from Romans 8 to this lamentation in 9. And what Paul and you and I cannot do, Christ has done. With compassion and weeping, our Savior saw Jerusalem as sheep without a shepherd. He entered Jerusalem on a donkey during the day with shouts of praise, and then he entered Jerusalem bound like an animal, sacrificed at night to mockery, spitting, and even being slapped. Christ became a curse for others, forsaken, that sinners by faith in Christ enjoy his presence with us always. My heart grieves for the lost so much that I die and be cursed forever for them. Who is able for such mighty things? Paul knows it's not him, but Christ. And he has given us the power to raise dry bones from the dead. Speak to these dry bones, son of man. That's what God told Ezekiel. Can these dry bones live? They're not just dead. There's no sinews. There's no tendons left. It's just skeleton. And dry bones don't listen because they're dead. Dry bones listen only by God's power. And to be raised from the dead comes the mighty voice of Christ to Lazarus in the tomb. Lazarus, come out. This is the gospel that Paul is preaching. He's saying, that is the power of God in his gospel. Weep for the lost, beloved, and then preach. Don't just weep from a distance. Boy, I really hope they're saved. It'd just be like one of those that Jesus said, pray for the more laborers and to the harvest. Do you remember how that went? As soon as they were done with the prayer, what did Jesus say? Good news. God's answered your prayers. Labor is about to be into the, the, the harvest, and it's you. That's exactly what Paul is getting at. He's sending out a mighty army in the church. See this in verses 4 and 5. They are Israelites, and to them belong the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the worship and the promises. To them belong the patriarchs, and from their race, according to the flesh, is the Christ, who is God over all, blessed forever. Amen. All of the blessing of our gracious God belongs to Israel. That's what he's saying. Paul is not saying it belongs to Israel outside of Christ. So don't go there. That's wonky doctrine. But leading the hearers in this Roman church to know it is all Christ who is of the Jewish race. He says all of this was passed down, given to Christ, and now it is going to the ends of the earth. But he's pointing out something for the Gentile hearers to know and to hold on to. He lovingly calls his kinsmen, not Jews, Israelites. The old language referring to the nation. So they're not just Jews, dear Roman Christians. There is something special, Paul says, that I want to be very clear about. To the Israelites belong all the gracious blessings of God handed into your hands by faith in Christ. So Paul writes this list in couplets to explain this inheritance of blessing. 
Now, before I go any further, the one thing that I've taken away in my study of this this week was, <clears throat> how, did, how do we do this generationally? Because this is kind of a generational thing. The previous generation of the Roman church would have been overwhelmingly, if not all, Jewish. You might have had some Greek God-fearers, but here you are in the next generation, and the Jewish population has significantly decreased, and the Gentiles are just coming in. And Paul is saying, that was right. We are a light to the Gentiles. That's what's supposed to be happening. But what happens with that generation that comes in? We do it better. It comes to the spiritual superiority that comes generation after generation through church history, and it even belongs to us. Oh, our parents, grandparents' generations of Christians were lame. They should be thankful that we have come along and we're going to fix all their wrongs. You know what's going to happen? Our generation ages and our grandkids are going to say, well, Gen X did everything wrong. They put in all these lame things and boy, they should be thankful that we came in to fix them. You get a kind of a haughtiness, especially when they come in in droves. Imagine the younger generations just taking over the pews here. Obviously, they would take the majority of the vote in our business meetings. They would challenge us. They would probably change a lot of the things that we hold on to dear. But then comes this, well, we're doing it better. And I think that's what Paul is confronting. Say, wait a minute now. Before you think, oh, we Gentiles, we're doing it right, apparently. Let me tell you about my kinsmen, the Israelites. So he puts these couplets to explain their inheritance of God's blessing. First he says, to them belong the adoption and the glory. It's meant to be put together. God called Israel my son. He didn't just say, they're my people. So there's obviously something special about Israelites. And if we take the adoption language from the Exodus, where Israel was taken by God from the house of slavery, then the belonging of the glory is seen at Mount Sinai, seen in the pillar of fire and smoke, which met with Moses like a friend. And we will, it will be seen when God's glory fills the earth, just as his glory fills the temple, as an end times promise given to Israel in Psalm 57.5. So to them belong the adoption and the glory. Also, Paul says, to them belong the covenants and the giving of the law. Again, meant to be held together. God has made covenants with Adam to work the land. Eve, that the woman will bear the snake-crushing head uh, of the Messiah. Abraham, of offspring to bless the nations. David, of a son who will sit on his throne forever to rule the entire earth. And God sovereignly chose Israel to give the law of Moses. But he continues on. To them belong the worship and the promises. If you look at the Old Testament, how many nations were invited to worship the one true God? It was just one. He chose them. He said, you will now worship me. All the other nations are making up gods. I don't have to reveal myself to any, but I've revealed myself to the least of the nations, the Israelites, that I may make known to the whole world of my creation, my great glory and my name. God chose Israel to worship him and to receive his everlasting promises. And it was handed down through the ages as an inheritance. And Paul ends in verse 5, to them belongs the patriarchs. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. To Israel, God has given the patriarchs. Do not look down upon the, the Israelites, Gentile Christians. God sovereignly brought you this gospel of his salvation the adoption, glory, covenants, his word, the privilege to worship him, his blessed promises, and this great spiritual ancestry by way of the race of the Israelites. For their race, according to the flesh, came the Christ whom we preached to you. Paul is arguing that the children of God receive Christ by faith alone. 
He's pleading with the Jews to see Jesus as the fulfillment of these blessings to God, of God to them. This is a continuation of all the blessings of God in our Old Testament, Paul is saying. It is all found in Christ. And he's still pleading with his kinsmen to be saved. Now, Paul said he had deep anguish in his heart for his kinsmen to know this truth of Jesus. What does this deep anguish in Paul's heart for the unsaved in Israel lead Paul to do? Beloved, unceasing grief leads to unceasing prayer. He mentions this over and over again in his letters. Pray without ceasing. So pray for the lost without ceasing. If you have deep anguish in your heart that the lost would come to know Christ, then you should have an unceasing prayer life that they would. To ears who have not heard, Paul set himself out to go preach boldly. It bothered Paul that there were ears who had never heard Christ. And it bothered him to the point that he was willing to travel and he'd do whatever it took that it would reach their ears. But also, and again, Paul is telling the truth. He is not lying. He's bearing witness in the Holy Spirit. He's saying this in Christ. He's saying that I would like to be cut off from Christ, cursed forever, that they would come to know him. And it comes with this willingness to be outcasted. We tend to think that, well, we need to be relevant to the world. We need to have some sort of like camaraderie. But the church's task is a task that gets them outcasted in the world. That is not celebrated in our world. Paul's willingness to be outcasted led him to preach even if it was uncomfortable. And I'll take a break here for a second to talk about our homes. I'm going to speak specifically to children. Respect your parents because they're not perfect. As a dad myself, I know I would die for my kids to be saved. It is in my prayer life that the Father, Lord, save my children. But I cannot save my kids, no matter how much I teach them, no matter how much I grieve over them. So, kids, listen to your parents' faith in Christ, because Jesus saves. And parents, you are parenting a worshiper. If your children follow you, follow your friendships that you make, all the decisions in your life, will they grow up to worship Christ or will they grow up to worship another? And that is the deep question for the age. Because we sometimes forget that a key element of disciple making within the church is parents. Parents, your children do not simply need bad behavior changed for good behavior, but the condition in their little hearts which causes bad behavior And the heart can only be changed by God's grace in Jesus Christ. I know your heart breaks with anxiety thinking about what they will be like. How will they make a good living in the future? Your greatest pain should be their salvation. What I want for my children is far more than being successful adults. I want them to be Christians. Even if this world persecutes them and they have a rough adulthood, I long for them to join Christ in eternity. And this longing is a deep pain in my soul. So my kids misbehave. Where do I take them? Simply to punishment? To correct them? I take them to Christ. And do you want to see this nation turn to Christ? Do you want to see the younger generation turn to Christ? Will they turn to the Lord if the church only bemoans the immoral slide of our nation? Will they turn to the Lord if the church only laments the political and cultural power struggles as if Jesus is not mighty enough to save? The world will not attend church until they are born again. They will not come here. You can invite them. They're not coming. Now I ask you this. Do you feel it? Do you feel the pain? The unceasing pains of sinners sliding into their graves and into wrath. 
the deep sorrow that Jesus is not being worshipped by those you know who are not here this morning? Do you feel the pain? What deep convictions we are to hold as Christians, the doctrines of Jesus Christ, that one is saved only by faith in Christ. Do these convictions stir in our hearts to tell everyone? Do you have a stirring to worship and honor the name of Christ, to proclaim his gospel in those in darkness, but to keep those passions suppressed, hiding the flame under a bushel? I fear that this is a great crime before our Savior. There is a contentment, beloved, in longing for souls to be saved. I know it sounds radically challenging to our flesh, but there is a restlessness that boils in the heart to throw my whole self before God and into His service for the sake of the gospel. And it is a restlessness that brings me to Christ for mercy and to find peace and rest. What do I mean by this? Well, Romans 9 has everything to do with Romans 12, 1, where Paul says, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. That is my plea to you and the unceasing pain in my heart that I have for you to love Christ. I urge you by the mercies of God to present your entire self as a living sacrifice to God. Serve him, worship him, proclaim him, make his name known in this world. Because Jesus is worthy of your worship. Will you follow him? And you'll say, well, I've sinned. You have said and you have done ugly things. You think Jesus would turn you away? No, beloved. In Christ, there is no condemnation. He replaces all sins with his righteousness to enjoy everlasting life with God. Jesus saves and he saves freely. So by the mercies of God, go to him.